All right, good morning. The last lesson, we gave an introduction and in a nutshell kind of greeting to just what the book of Amos teaches upon and touches upon. And that is an action of an unappreciative, disobedient, self-righteous, ungodly people and nation and a reaction of circumstances, a reaction of and from the God of the people, a reaction of judgment. And Amos took a stand and stood up to the world powers in his day. Now, the later prophets that you Old Testament Bible readers are familiar with, such as Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, these prophets spoke of God's judgment first upon Israel and then prophesied judgmental prophecies to outer nations. Amos was just the opposite. He spoke of the judgment of God to the nations round about Israel first. Then he prophesied all things of judgment pertaining to Israel. And Amos lived, and we will get to this in verse 1, but Amos resided in the southern kingdom of Judah, and he activated his foreign missions, so to speak, in the northern kingdom of Israel. So let's begin the book of Amos. Verse 1 of chapter 1. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So we read here that Amos was among the shepherds of Tekoa. Nothing is known of Amos's person beyond what this book tells us. But with what I believe to be the most complete and thorough explanation of the character of one's identity out of all first verses of the books, we pretty much have we pretty much have read in this first verse all we need to know of Amos. For it's it's not the outward appearance and occupation of Amos that we profit from, but his recorded words in obedience to the summons of God. Now, Amos was not ate up with materialism, the popularity of the time. His mind was not contaminated with the, the world's thought in the world's ways. The blue-collar life of raising livestock away from all these city lights, they sharpened Amos's eyes, intensified his ability to, to hear, to hear. And without all the distractions of the rat race way of life, old Amos had a quickening in his conscience to respond to the call of God. Now, after reading... After reading the book of Amos several, several times in preparation for delivering this study, allow me to, to just quickly share the character traits of this man to assist you all in the type of mindset and understanding Amos harbored in the era in which he lived and how he kept a pure mind, no distractions, allowing him to accept marching orders from God. Now we today, if we do not exhibit self-control, can allow the five senses to react to carnal temptations and at that time totally flat out miss a blessing or a the way you should go moment from God. But while Amos, keeping his flock by, uh, by his occupation, he had his house in order. The house upstairs, you know, was mined. He had his house in order, enough to be conscientious of a definite or precise call from God. He wasn't, uh, well, being from Tekoya, he was removed from all the hoorah of organized religion in Jerusalem. But as he was engulfed in the dust of rounding up his livestock day to day, he was able to keep his mind cleaned 
his mind open and attentive to the movement, to the calling of God, to the calling of God's Spirit. And he was free and at peace, away from the distractions and the contaminants of the behaviors of society, the characteristics of the culture. So this Amos, this herdsman, well, he was probably always in work clothes, always wearing work clothes. Nothing particular about him as far as looking like a religious fella, delivering a message of judgment from God. But most of the prophets during Israel's biblical history could be recognized. They could be recognized by their appearance or their professional or reverent religious functions, like Isaiah and Daniel, for instance. Now, Amos claimed no degrees in scholarship. Like Paul, he was a Torah professor. Amos never claimed anything as such. Amos claimed no degrees. In fact, in chapter 7 in Amos, he made it clear in a humble posture in verse 14 of chapter 7, saying to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a herdsman and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed my flock. The Lord said to me, Go prophecy to my people Israel. Now, Amos minded his own business. This is what I gather from reading this book. He minded his own business. He didn't claim Jerusalem or some local religious building of popularity as his house of operations. Amos was on foot. He was a herdsman that received a call from God. Now you can you can uh, harbor an, an abundance of peace and clarity living a simple life as Amos. Mind your business and be about your father's business. Mind your business and your God. Amos held responsibility for his livestock and cultivation of his nursery of sycamore trees. And as we will learn in chapters to come, many many affiliated Amos among the poor because of his condemnation of luxury from self-service, denying God. But Amos didn't advertise his achievements. He was a well-to-do sheep master. Now, as he began to prophesy in the towns, his simple blue-collar character was indeed strange in the midst of this materially dressed and in-style crowd, which brought on curiosity, and in turn, it gained him the ears of the people for a time. And many believed him to be arrogant. He rattled the people's cages. He called them out with his stern, stoic view of life and his blunt approach to its problems. For they thought him arrogant. He struck the nerves of many. But few would hear his testimony. And as we will see in this study, Amos would not compromise his convictions nor water down the message of God. Those that thought him arrogant, they had a defense to degrade him, for Amos offended them with his raw, strict approach to these accusers, their poor morals. Now, these outward religious town folk would dare not step foot in the craggy, volcanic topography, the hilly territory of Tekoya, where Amos hailed from. This sloping terrain that led straight down into the deep uh, Dead Sea, where in this desolate, silent country world of Tekoya, Amos was made, made aware of God's presence, and he realized his mission for God. Now, Tekoya, it was, I can't be exact, but it was about 10 to 15 miles outside of Jerusalem the center of Judah's existence. And with the Temple of Solomon standing there in Jerusalem, made it the hub. It made it the megachurch of religious life for the southern kingdom of Judah. And Amos was quite familiar with the plain church in Jerusalem, for he was a native of the southern kingdom, which was the... Uh, 
which was the tribe of Judah. But his foreign missions went on, as we will soon see, it went on into the northern kingdom in Israel, where he slandered a priest before the king. And the king threatened Amos to get out of town, to forage and eat your own bread, and to stop the rhetoric and stop disrupting the carnal peace of that territory. He got ran out of town for speaking all things God. Now before we close, let's read Amos 1.1 1, 1 again. The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoya, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the great earthquake. Now the earthquake, this earthquake happened during Uzziah's reign, who was also, well, went by the name Azariah, and he experienced judgment, as recorded in Second Chronicles chapter 26, verses 18 through 24, but we'll read 18 and 21 for time's sake. It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who were consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Verse 21. And King Uzziah was a leper to the days of his death. And being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. Now Jewish tradition, now I've read, coming from historic Jewish authors, apply this earthquake, uh, earthquake, applied this earthquake occurring when King Uzziah usurped the work and manner of the priest, offering incense in the temple, violating the temple rites. And this earthquake was recorded in Zechariah chapter 14, verse, verse uh, 5 as well. And ye shall flee the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach Azal. And ye shall flee as ye fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So Jeroboam the second, as we read in Amos 1.1. 1, 1. A little bit about him. He reigned here when Israel was abundant in wealth and flourished. And Jeroboam was a disobedient and rather wicked man. Though an ungodly man, God would spare, as we'll read in the book of Amos, God would spare his people. Not the people, but God would spare his people. Now, maybe we'll uh, get into a little doom and gloom next lesson as we move through the first chapter of Amos. See, the majority of people egg this on. They invite tribulation that reflects a Hollywood apocalyptic movie. But if their wish comes to, what do you think they'll really sincerely run to? Man, they'll run to the government of whatever municipality they live in. So this next verse, going into verse 2, next lesson, we'll get into a little bit of doom and gloom. It'll carry on for quite a while. Till next time.